afternoon, everybody. This is Tanish Laverne Graham with BlackInAmerica.com. I am super excited about my guest this afternoon. We're kicking off uh, Toronto International Film Festival. And my guest today is Aaron Gilbert. If you don't know Aaron Gilbert, Google him. He <laughs> is. <laughs> Google Aaron Gilbert, okay? His, his film company, Bronze Studios, has brought us some of the most amazing films that will definitely go down in cinematic history. Um, Birth of a Nation, Fences, um, oh my God, Queen and Slim. Um, there, there, there are just so many. Google Aaron Gilbert. Aaron, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you for all of that. That's very nice to hear. I appreciate it. Oh, you're here. more than welcome. You are what we consider an ally when it comes to Black culture and Black creatives. You mm -hmm. know, your your company turns 10 years old this year. Yep. Congratulations on that. Thank you. It's it's truly hard to believe. There's there's uh, you know, and I know it's gonna it's a funny thing to say, but I only started in this business 10 years ago, and that's how old the company is. So it's been quite a an amazing sort of growth, especially over the last four or five years. And really the two films that put Braun on the map, uh, i.e. the first time anybody kind of went, well, who is that company was Birth of a Nation and Fences, which both we made in 2015 and came out in 16. And you know, before that we had made and been part of a number of films that had had some success, but nothing that was like noisy. Uh, not, and not just noisy, like a noisy period, like everywhere. And obviously with those two films, uh, uh, they're both so special to me all the, all the way through. And, uh, and, and even five years later, I think about them all the time because they're part of how we got started and we've just continued to be able to grow uh, since then. Yeah. What was it about those two films? Because they're pretty risky films. Pretty risky films for a brand new film company to come out the gate with. Yeah, we yeah. were, I guess we were like, half, we were sort of halfway through our life at that time. Uh, we were four and a half, five years in. You know, when I first read uh, Birth of a Nation, I, had, I, would I was introduced to the project through Nate Parker's then agent. Uh, and I, and when he, I read it, I was like, wow, like this, this is powerful. This is incredible. And, and I'll be honest, I first read it and I'm like, geez, I don't know how to, I'm not sure how to make this movie. This is a tough movie. Like, what do we have to budget? How's this going to work? You know, there's obviously themes inside that film that we knew were going to be challenging for me, right? Um, and then I met Nate Parker and spent time with Nate and learned of his journey on how to get to making of that movie. Uh, and quite frankly, there was no way we weren't making the movie afterwards. And we were in production eight weeks later. And that's how fast we moved on it when that happened. Because honestly, for me, once I learned about that, uh, you know, about Nat Turner and learned about the, the process of that film, but learned about the history that was involved and learned about how that history is just not known, uh, period, you know, like in the black community or other, it's just not known. And that's a problem. That's a travesty that that's the case. So uh, for me, uh, that's why I responded to it. And you know what, like when you, you got to try, you got to feel these things in your gut. And for me, I knew there was something special about that story and about telling that story and about that filmmaker uh, and on paper, maybe it didn't check boxes, but it checked boxes for me. Uh, and, you know, I've sort of learned over the years is that when I trust my gut, uh, I'm right more more times than I'm not. And with Fences, it was a little different. Obviously, you have Fences, one of the That's greatest. a classic, August Wilson. August Wilson. You know, when I learned about it, I was like, oh my God, somebody's touching Fences. <laughs> yeah, big time. Well, obviously, the, the person who touched it was the best person to touch it. The two that, you know, obviously it was not, not the original production, but the historical production from Viola and Denzel on Broadway, which obviously was so acclaimed. Um, and when we, I had seen it on Broadway as well and, and was familiar with it. Um, and honestly, when that project uh, came available, it was something we could be involved in. I, and just to be clear, I didn't produce that. That's produced by the very talented Todd Black. Uh, okay. Was a financial partner, uh, you know, in that film, but I wanted to be involved. Like, a, it's DW, who's one of the greatest there is, and I'm so fortunate that Denzel agreed to be part of our Toronto uh, in conversation uh, sessions that we're doing uh, next this coming week. Uh, but for me, it was uh, you look at Denzel, you look at Viola, and then the strength of that cast, and most importantly, the words on the page, you know, from August Wilson, one of the greatest writers out there in history. Uh, just like with Birth, we had to be part of it. So well done, so well done. What an entrepreneur, you know, what is your advice to emerging filmmakers, um, young entrepreneurs who 
want to tell story, who want to have film production companies, you know, what do you think, you know, when, when, when you talk to people, you know, who want to be in Hollywood, work in this business, what are some of the biggest misnomers that you think they have about working in television and film production and owning their own production company? Well, the one thing is I love is that, you know, I've got lots of friends who are outside of the industry who, who think my life is glamorous. And I like to explain to them, my life is glamorous about six or eight hours a year. That's how glamorous my <laughs> Did you life say is. six or eight hours a year? That's about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because uh, it's, it's, it's work, you know, it's hard work. Like, um, you know, I think, I think what I would say more than anything, and this is a lesson that I learned the hard way. And what I would say is that you have to get behind material that, you know, you are unequivocally moved by that you have to tell that story, you have to be behind it. Like, it's so hard to get films made, especially hard for young filmmakers to get their first project or projects plural made. And if you're, if you're making it just because you think, I'm going to make a lot of money from this, or mm. I can get this actor here because so-and-so knows so-and-so and I can make this happen, that's the wrong way to approach it. Like, the, the, I've been involved in several first-time filmmaker uh, movies, uh, including Nate Parker, for that matter. Uh, and uh, including right now, we've got two uh, first time filmmakers that we're going to be making their first films in 21. Including, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, including the incredibly talented Sam Bailey, Samantha Bailey. We're making this movie. Uh, if you don't know her, please check her out for your people. To, she made that uh, uh, series Brown Girls, the online series. Oh, and her, yeah. And okay. She's gone on to make, uh, to direct a lot of television and, and do some really great things. But as a film, this is her first movie and she's going to be a really important voice uh, for a long time. But anyway, long and short of it is, uh, apologies for being long winded, but that first film, those first few films have to be driven by something bigger than just a, a goal of making money. Wow. It can't be around that. That can be a byproduct, but that can't be the goal of it. And, and you'll, those who you talk to, including folks like me, uh, will feel that if it's coming across the table or coming across the phone or through a Zoom chat or other. Um, it has to be something that you must get made. There's a reason behind it. There's a passion for it. Uh, and with those who know how to communicate that passion and how to tell that story, uh, they'll, get, they'll get those shows made. Uh, they'll find people like myself and others who will be around to support them. You know? That's amazing. You know, this climate that we're in, COVID-19, um, a resurgence in the Black Lives Matter movement, there's now um, an interesting interest, and I, I'm, I'm phrasing that very specifically. There's a very interesting interest in Black culture and Black creatives. Everybody wants Black creatives, Black content. Um, do you think this is a trend, or do you think this is something that is going to be ongoing? Boy, I hope it's not a trend. Um, you know, I think uh, it's wonderful to see so many companies announcing um, diversity uh, and inclusion, um, new policies and new hires and other great, amazing. Um, right. Because uh, you and I both know diversity and, and inclusion has been on the table for quite some time. It has. Right? It has. So and it's been a big conversation of diversity and inclusion. And then it just looks, it, it looks like this, right? That's right. That's right. Now, there's COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, this uprising, you know, mm -hmm. and now and again, there's this interest in diversity and inclusion and Black creatives. And I'm just really interested in what your opinion is about it. Well, listen, I think however these important stories and however a more diverse, more inclusive environment is created, great. You know, like I've been drawn and my wife and I have been behind this since day one, the last 10 years. So it's not new for us, but I'm happy that for others, they're, they're being more aware that this is something that they must do and create more opportunities, both in front and behind the camera for that matter. Um, I think the only way that we stay on it is all types of companies that includes the major studios who've announced initiatives here, that includes the streamers who've announced initiatives and bigger independents like myself, you know, we all have to make sure that we're continuing that uh, going forward. Like the only way that, that that continues is that people have to be talking about it constantly. It can't, even right now with what's happening, you know, the, obviously with the travesty and, you know, I think, you know, we're working with the incredible Benjamin Crump on a, on a docu-series. Yeah. It's really a privilege to work with him and, and just to learn from him. And like the work that he's doing is like, I don't know how that guy gets through a day because his phone is ringing nonstop, unfortunately. And until his phone stops ringing so much, uh, there's work to be done. And, you know, for me, that's why we have to continue to tell these stories, continue to talk about it, continue to press 
uh, every major company in our business that this has to be a mandate that's continued forward. It can't just be something that's good politically right now. It has to work for the long term. It's the only way that things happen, you know? Now, rather quickly, we are here to also discuss Toronto International Film Festival. There are six conversation series and Braun is hosting three of them. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what those conversation series are? Well, Braun is, as you mentioned earlier, celebrating our 10th anniversary this year, which is great. And we had this wonderful, elaborate, big party that we were going to do in LA back in May. Very obviously right. that didn't happen. And every year we do a big party in Toronto. Last year we had like, I don't know, 1800 people or something like that. We do a big party every year. That's not going to happen. So we, we, ha we wanted to find a way that we could uh, celebrate uh, and quite honestly didn't want to go near any topics, uh, didn't want to be talking about this the, f the last several months mm. uh, while the world was already grappling with what, what the world was grappling in, like the reality of bronze 10th anniversary, who cares, uh, quite frankly, given what was going on in the world. Um, but now that things are kind of through, I hope we all hope the worst parts, at least the educational people understand what this virus is now, people are working, uh, although everyone needs to be continue to be safe because numbers are still not good in the US yeah. and parts of Canada as well. Um, it's a problem and people have to be aware of it. But, you know, for me, um, what this opportunity was in getting involved with Cameron, who I know well at, at Toronto, Cameron, uh, who sort of co-heads the festival, was in talking with him, it's like, how do we create something that can be uh, fun, that can celebrate our, our anniversary, but at the same time can actually talk uh, about things that matter, which are the kinds of films that we're making and, um, and the kinds of stories that we get behind. And I was very fortunate that, you know, we have the incredible Dean Ice, you know, Club Quarantine, uh, obviously his, his voice, his uh, in the community period, globally, was such an important um, person for what he did during the, the scary times of the yeah. pandemic. Not that it's not scary now, but he created a sense of community. He created a sense of togetherness online. And really with him and the incredible filmmaker, uh, Anthony Mandler, who he and I made a film together called Monster that's going to be out uh, in the next few months, but then have another film together. But also he's very well known as literally one of the most uh, celebrated, you know, commercial and music video directors of all time. And those two are talking about music and culture and the impact of visuals, uh, uh, what we see within the music community as well. And again, having Dean nice as part of that. And then separately, again, like everyone we asked, uh, we were very fortunate that everybody said yes. And, you know, Denzel, who we've worked with twice and are doing another show with this year and next year, hopefully a fourth, uh, he's one of the greatest literally living legends, truly. And I felt very honored that when I asked him to be part of this, he said yes. And again, hearing from him and hearing from the incredible filmmaker, Barry Levinson, who are such different wow. kinds of voices, uh, but together, you know, have careers that are unparalleled in the business over the last many, many years. And, you know, I think the conversation from them is really going to talk about not only the history of film, but like how our story is going to be told a little differently. Uh, going forward in the future? How are we going to be more aware of how to tell stories going forward? So, and then with Ava, Ava was doing her own thing and we, we got involved sponsoring that. That's not something we curated, but that was made available to us of something we could sponsor. And of course, she's such an important voice, um, period. And knowing that her topic of conversation, we wanted to be part of supporting that. And then lastly, my man, uh, Larry Jackson, who's a good friend of mine, who runs, uh, you know, head of content at Apple Music and oh, wow. the most important, yeah, he's such an important voice. Uh, you know, he's, he touches culture in such an incredible way, the artist that he works with, the things that he's done. Uh, so having him and Benj Mr. Benjamin Crump together in one of our other sessions as well uh, around TIFF. So again, we had to make the best out of our 10 year anniversary and we feel like we've done that in a, in a wonderful way with the support of TIFF and the support of these incredible artists that are there to you know, be part of this with us. You know, my last question to you, this COVID-19 has brought about obviously fear you know, the fear of unknown, you know, we don't know what's happening next. You know, what, in your opinion, is the beauty of this moment? Because there is beauty in this moment. You know, this is a time for great conversation. This is a time to create. This is a time to, you know, engage in new conversation, um, you know, to tap new and innovative people to help get your, you know, projects, you know, to the forefront. You know, in your opinion, what is the beauty of this time? 
There, there's a couple of things. Uh, can you hear me okay? I, I, just, I can. Noise behind me. Okay, cool. Uh, there's a couple of things. Like on, on a personal level, uh, I'm going to tell you that I've loved being home and my oldest son, who was working out of our uh, out of LA on, on a show of our, uh, that we're part of, and you know he's home now in Vancouver with his two uh, sisters and my wife and I. And you know, for me on a selfish level, uh, being able to just kind of slow down a minute because I live back and forth between Vancouver and LA. I go back and forth and spend sort of half my time in each place. And I've been home in British Columbia for six months. And uh, wow. so staying put, um, I think just being on that kind of a schedule and being able to have that time with the family and just not being on a plane literally twice a week, every week, uh, that's been great personally. On the business level, you know, I'm not going to lie, like the first couple of months were scary. Um, we had a bunch of shows that were shut down, including, you know, Dev Patel's directorial debut that we were making in India and other shows that we had coming together early part of this year. So for a minute, it was really scary. Like, how are we going to get through this with different lines of our uh, lines of revenue cut off? Because aside from production, uh, and not only with production, like you can't recapture all the millions of dollars in development you put into all these shows because the shows aren't happening. So it was sort of a double hit. Uh, and then so many of our important movies and wonderful films from Respect to Ghostbusters to Candyman and all these other films were either pushed back late in the year or pushed into next year. So now that other revenue line is cut off. So the first couple months of this were really a bit of a fearful time of us trying to figure out, okay, how do we, how do we pivot here? How do we create a bit of uh, revenue? How do we make sure that we're going to be okay making our way through it? Because a lot of companies really struggle, as we know, yeah. uh, getting through this. And we've been fortunate enough that we were able to pivot into a launch of a new division called Braun Digital, uh, which we started in April wow. 1st and now have two uh, TV series in full production through Braun Digital and three more starting this fall. And it's going to... Well, maybe I need it. to pitch Braun Digital. I certainly have a show idea. I certainly have a show idea. Yeah. Well, we're working, uh, our production technology partners are the incredible Epic Games and the Unreal Engine and using that, that gaming engine, we would call it like a live action approach to animation. And it's been really incredible. And that has been uh, a lot of fun to see that happen. So with all the scariness that happened, me sort of working with our creative and production teams to pivot into that pipeline. Now, like we're going to, like I said, we're going to have five shows uh, in full production, big premium shows but between now uh, in this year, so in our first six months, seven months, we'll have created that, which is wonderful. Now we're getting back into live action production again, which is also great. Uh, but that six months was, I think, a time where you can kind of take a step back and hopefully personally kind of look at things a little differently, which I've done, you know, and realizing maybe I don't have to travel every single week. Maybe I can go every wow. second week and be a little easier on my body, a little easier with the family, make everyone's life a little better. So that's a big, that's a huge thing for me, for sure. Um, but then I think within that, like what you saw, even like you know, talked about D nice, like what you saw is incredible invention, incredible entrepreneurship, incredible new things created this last six months, you know, selfishly, like, uh, sorry, self, self, can say it right. Selfishly, <laughs> selfishly, or more so with Braun, I can't speak right now. With Braun, you know, obviously this new entity in Braun Digital wouldn't be here had this, this crazy crisis not uh, created, not had happened, excuse me. And now we have a whole new arm of our company that I think can be very lucrative for us and, and also help us tell incredible stories very quickly and efficiently going forward. Like, so I think with this kind of craziness and what I talk about with COVID, you know, I've been fortunate enough, I've never had to be drafted to go to war or, or my, my, my age group had, hadn't, hasn't had a war really, you know, yeah. directly. You know, my parents had to deal with the Second World War in Vietnam, my grandparents, of course, Second World War, et cetera. You know, but for me, um, these, this is our war in a way. These are you know, 20 years from now, we're going to talk about the COVID years. You know what I mean? Yep. And I think what happens in that kind of an environment, which is what we're seeing, Dean Ice, Derek being one of those uh, incredible people that I come through that. Obviously, he was very, very talented and very accomplished before that. But now his scale and his visibility is just so wonderful and, and huge. Um, so that's amazing the exciting part about this. That's the part that, that people have. People are can adapt. People can figure out ways through this and all sorts of new ways of consuming content, making content, producing things. It's you can see it, you can feel it. There's an energy about that. Once people got through this, the fear of it all, which you know it's still there, but yeah. you now know what we're wrestling with, all of us, uh, and hopefully much sooner than later, you know this is all dealt with. But uh, until then, I think we're just going to continue to see people. Um, pushing the boundaries and finding new ways to tell stories. Aaron, this was amazing. 
Pleasure. I'm so happy I had the opportunity to speak with you. I've been a huge fan and a student, not just of your work, but really trying to study your business acumen. You know, um, I was jokingly saying, hey, I need to pitch Braun, but you know, I'm an independent broadcast yeah. entrepreneur. You know, I have a background working in television news. And with women, you know, sometimes the older you get, they're like, you know, we don't have a place for you here anymore. You know, and so I love story. I love journalism. I love entertainment journalism. And so I had to create my own space. You know, and the great part about it is I own all of my own content. I own it all, That's you know, powerful. and my voice is authentic. And I get to tell stories that I believe, you know, my generation wants to hear. You know, I tell the Generation X story from a Generation X point of view, and that's really important. So, again, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. Your CMO, Cassandra Butcher, is someone who I also love and admire and respect, and I was so thank great you. to learn that she was coming on board with your studio. So, Yeah, two years already she's been with Braun. I, I can't been, believe uh, it. Yeah. I can't she's believe it. Lady, for sure. Yeah, her resume yeah. is just is impeccable. Impeccable. So um, again, oh, I'm happy to do this again sometime. You know, I will. Like, I yeah. think. Can I pitch Tiffany? Or actually, I can just I can reach out to um, Cassandra. Actually, talk to Cass about it. Yeah, talk to Cass yeah. About it. I will. Thank you so much, Aaron. Enjoy the rest of your day. Right, Continue. Be safe. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.